Hey guys, I am here today with Maria Akopian and she is a family law attorney in California, but she is also a divorce coach and personal transformation guide. She is passionate about psychology and studying the human condition and understanding what makes people tick. Throughout the process of becoming a licensed attorney, she also became a certified life coach and obtained training in marriage and family therapy and has spent over the past 10 years, heavily immersed in the personal development field, actively working to become the best version of herself. So she's here today to impart all of her words of wisdom and have a chat about divorce, divorce coaching, personal development, and all of the things. So welcome, Maria. Hi, Renee. Thanks so much for having me. That was a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I actually really love and am fascinated that you're a divorce attorney, you know, you did all of that stuff, but then that wasn't the end. And, you know, you and I are kind of in similar spaces like that, but it was like, okay, what more can we do? Because as a divorce attorney, our roles are, our hands are tied a little bit in how we can serve our clients. So can you just um, share what your journey was and how you kind of went from one to the other and um, what you're working on now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as you said, I mean, with being an attorney, it's we're stuck to dealing with the, the legal aspects. And of course, we do therapy as well. I mean, we counsel our clients, we help them through the process and guide them and you know, deal with the emotions as well. But as far as what we can do, it's representing them and their, and their legal issues. And so before becoming an attorney, I've always wanted to be a therapist. That was my, my dream. You know, back in high school, when people asked me what, what I wanted to be, I said I wanted to be a therapist. And so somewhere along the lines, I found myself drawn to the legal, going into uh, law school and becoming an attorney. And so I did that. I decided that's what I was going to do and completely switched gears. But I, during law school and learning about the law, it was always family law or that area that drew, drew the most to me, I think because of the emotions, I think because of the, the dark night of the soul that a lot of people go through. Um, I think that was kind of where I had the passion where you can help people with the legal, but then there's also that real human experience in it as well. And so going through the, the legal education, becoming licensed, I immediately went into family law and doing that work and working with the clients and representing them. Again, I felt like there was more I could be doing with them. And, and rather than billing them just to be their therapist, I felt like there was, um, it, it would serve them as well if I can help them with the holistic approach. So with the legal training, with the legal background, letting them know what they can expect, helping them strategize, but then also covering the, the emotions and the real human experience within that process as well. And to me, when I first heard about divorce coaching, it just, a light bulb went off and I said, this is it. This is exactly what I felt that I needed to be doing where it's just the perfect mix of, of the two and in, in my experience and the work I've been doing. So are you practicing now too, or are you uh, focusing on the divorce coaching? Right now, I'm just focusing on the divorce coaching. Um, of course, I can represent clients and take on clients, but I think with my passion and my draw right now is the divorce coaching side. What I think is really interesting is the idea of a divorce attorney. There's only so much we can do. Like there is only a range that we can help our clients. And so much of how they come out the other end really has everything to do with mindset and the emotional piece of it and the work that a divorce coach does with them. Um, and so can you just explain a little bit what the difference is as to what your work looks like as a divorce attorney versus what it looks like as a divorce coach, if someone's unclear as to what that is? Absolutely. And, and that's great that you're clarifying that because I do get that question from uh, people looking to either to work with me because ultimately what the way I explain it is it, it's similar, uh, but I won't be representing them as far as their, their legal issues. And so there's also the the fine line between giving legal advice, because if I'm not really representing them, I don't want to take on that and, and give that assumption that I'm giving them the legal advice and telling them what to do on the legal end. But it's more of the education. It's more of the informing them of how things work, what is likely going to happen or what they can expect, and just giving them the insights and the clarity that they need to move through the process 
um, as far as their their strategies and the legal issues go. Um, but as far as you know, the emotional, I do like to incorporate a lot of the personal development techniques and tools and things that uh, have helped me in, in my own life and just shift a lot of where I was before to the how um, much more of a, a confident and, and person that I am today. And so a lot of that does involve you know, mindfulness and certain techniques through the, the therapeutic side and just personal development. So I think with the coaching, it is a lot of the using those tools and as well as on the legal side, education and, and allowing them to know what to expect. And um, I think that's where the biggest difference is. Right, right. And a lot of lawyers also practice some form of sort of not specified or not intentional divorce coaching, but some lawyers don't, and they're not going to give their clients that emotional support that they need. So um, you talked about the personal development. I live in that space too. I love it. I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. What <laughs> is your top couple favorite personal development books? Uh, it's actually one that you've been posting about the the magic and um, that one I think was fascinating because it's all about gratitude and just how yeah. important that is I think a lot of us think like okay gratitude yeah I know I should be thankful or you know have that but to really dig into it and make it into a practice and and know that it's not just you know being thankful about certain things but actually make it into a, a like I said a, a practice of it so I think that the magic is really insightful um, oh god there's so many uh, the first one that really stood out to me, I think what started the whole thing was uh, Deepak Chopra's The Spontaneous Fulfillment of Desire. I don't, have you read that one? Before? I haven't read that one. It's so fascinating. It's it's more about consciousness and how things work and synchronicities. And But I think that to me was so insightful of how everything's so connected and how mm. um, we are one with, with ourselves, with each other, with the universe, however, you know, whatever belief systems people have, it was just so fascinating to me. So I think that one I have to shout out because it, it kickstarted everything for me. I love that. I'm going to have to pick it up as soon as this interview is over uh, and add it to my ever growing pile. But how do you coach someone to be grateful when they're in the middle of a divorce or they're saying my soon to be ex is a complete asshole. And like, how are you grateful? for that? Or how are you, can you be grateful for a divorce? I know it, it's hard when you're in that it's very difficult to just switch from feeling these intense emotions to just all of a sudden being grateful. But I think the way it helps is to find even the littlest things that have nothing to do with divorce. They have nothing to do with the marriage or even your ex that at the moment you're being really triggered by, but finding the littlest things, even in, in life that you can be grateful you know, maybe even if, if people have kids, you know, if my clients have kids, if to put their issues aside or the situations they're going through, just knowing that they're grateful for their children or for the, uh, what they have their, um, whether they or even break it down to their breathing, they're alive, they woke up today, they have food that they can eat, whatever it is, and just finding the littlest things that that resonate with them, that help them, that uplift them is a great way to start practicing gratitude. And then eventually, you know, when the healing happens and when they're moved through the emotions and they're in a better place, that's when you can start working on maybe being grateful for um, the love that you did have, or, you know, the marriage that you did have and, and things like that. I know it's really hard to jump into that right away, but yeah. when you've made gratitude a practice, it becomes a little bit easier. And I always tell people just to start really small, like you said, and just every morning, three things, it could be something like you're grateful for the coffee that you're drinking and just start small until it's a habit. And then once you do that, that you can start to get a little bit bigger. And maybe one day you could be grateful for your ex. <laughs> it yes, probably absolutely. takes some time, but, but you can get there for sure. Mm -hmm. How does someone deal with being lonely when they're going through a divorce? I know this is something that you talk about as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's hard. And I think it catches a lot of people off guard because maybe they weren't expecting to experience loneliness. Um, you know, they have their marriage that fell apart that they can't look to their spouse. And so I've noticed a lot of times people maybe lose friends or maybe they have the people that they thought would be there for them that aren't there anymore. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. And so you never think that's going to happen until for some people it does. And I think it's just acknowledging that that is a possibility and, and letting 
kind of being easy about it, I think helps to kind of accept that, you know, really has nothing to do with you and what you're going through, but maybe that's how the other person chose to, to react or how they chose to respond. And it's not personal, but as far as that, I think just getting support in any way possible, you know, whether it's working with the therapist, working with the coach, if loneliness is not an easy place to be and it does not feel good at all. So if there's any chance to connect with somebody, either maybe through Facebook groups or somebody that that's going through it as well, I think helps because then you can kind of have that person to connect with who knows what you're going through. Um, but I think staying in a place of loneliness isn't, isn't, it doesn't help to stay in that place. So if you can reach out for help or find any way to deal with the loneliness, it goes a long way. And I think that that's a really good point is that friends do fall away when you're going through a divorce because maybe you were couples that always went out and all of a sudden it's awkward and they don't know what to do. So they just don't invite you. I, my own personal divorce story is I was in a state that I was friends with. Um, it wasn't a state that I was born and raised in. So all of my friends were my husband's friends. And so when I got divorced, um, they just naturally fell away because there was history with them. Um, and it wasn't any sort of ill intent, but it just sort of happened. And I found myself in a, in a place where it's like, okay, my friends aren't around me. You know, what do you do with that? And, you know, going out and joining things and becoming involved in um, classes or activities or whatever it is that where you start to surround yourself with other people and meet other people rather than just sit in your place on the weekends that, you know, maybe you don't have your kids in crying. Like it's, it, it, sometimes it takes some effort to, mm -hmm. to cure that loneliness. Yeah. And that must've been hard. I'm sorry you had to go through. Oh that. no, it's okay. I'm fine. <laughs> it's all good. I made lots of new friends. <laughs> so, um, there, you talk about creating a parent, a, a creating a plan for your divorce and why it's so important. Can you just speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've seen too many clients, even on the legal side, that jump into hiring an attorney, going through the litigation route, because they assume that that's just what you do. I mean, they didn't expect to be in this position to begin with, or maybe they've had other people that went through a divorce and that's what they did. And so I think it doesn't help because there are so many other options when it comes to divorce. I mean, as you know, there's many different facets of divorce. There's mediation and collaborative divorce. There isn't just the litigation route. And then on top of it, if you're not prepared, then it's you get more overwhelmed than what you already are going through. I mean, you already have the emotions to deal with. And so now you've gone in and you expect your attorney to do everything for you. And sometimes depending on the attorney, they don't always guide their clients through it. And maybe they have no idea what to even expect. So now they're chasing their attorneys, trying to get information or try to understand what's going on. And that doesn't benefit them because one, they're having to, to pay for that time. And two, it's again, adding to the overwhelm and the stress of everything. So what I like to tell people is if you can take the time to, um, you know, have go through certain steps that you can plan and prepare, maybe organize documents, maybe mentally start getting in the right headspace for it. Um, you know, dealing with the the emotional aspects, gather yourself as much as possible. So then, and then also figure out what your options are. Do you want to go through the litigation route? Is that something that's the right fit for your particular situation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you want a more perhaps peaceful route? Is mediation an option? Do you think that's something that would be a more viable uh, option to give you the outcome that you're looking for? And so there's a lot of planning, a lot of preparing. As you know, there, there's a lot that goes into it. So the more prepared a client is, the more insights that they have, the more um, documents and organization they've done ahead of time, it just makes the process so much smoother. Absolutely. And can you speak a little bit about the internal journey that someone goes through when they're going through a divorce? We certainly know all, what happens on the outside and we talked about what happens with friends, but what about inside and what's happening with that person? Yeah, I, it, it's so, it's a case by case basis. It's so different for everybody. It also depends on if they're the ones initiating it or if they're the ones on the receiving end of it, because uh, maybe if somebody has been thinking about divorce for a while, they've had the, the time to 
play around with the idea. They've had the time to prepare. Um, you know, maybe it's not such a shock for them because they've already let go of the relationship in their mind and their heart. And so for them, it's easier to at least start the process. Of course, there's still the wave of emotions that kick in afterwards, but for them, it might be an easier transition. They might be more confident about their decision. And, and so they're more able to initiate the process versus if they're on the other end, maybe they're completely blindsided. They had no idea what was even happening or that it was at that point where the spouse wanted the divorce. And so now here they are dealing with the shock of the situation, um, denying the fact that maybe they're in that process. So of course there are those stages of grief. And I know you talk about that as well too, just the different processes that people go through on an emotional level. And so having to move through that, it, it depends on the person. I mean, some people stay stuck in maybe the anger, maybe the revenge and the resentment, and it's hard for them to get out of that because of maybe their situation and what they've gone through. Maybe for others, it's easier for them to move through the process because they either just, you know, they've done the work in advance or they're just ready to move on. So they just want to get to the other end of it. And so they've accepted that it's over. They're looking forward to their starting a new life, however that may look for them. And so it's so different. It really just depends on the person. But I think initially people have that common thread of the stages that they go through some faster than others. Um, but it's so important to go through those, the grief, you know, the, the anger, the, and then get to the acceptance is key. And so some people don't even get to that until maybe after their divorce is over years later down the line, which is common. There's really no timeline for it. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Do, do you see a trend with um, people skipping some of those steps and then finding themselves actually stalling or halting the healing process? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there are some people that, you know, maybe get through a certain phase. It's, it's never a linear process. They don't really go through, okay, now we're in denial. Okay, now we're in bargaining. So they may jump around. Um, I, I've seen a lot of people where maybe they're relieved to get divorced, but then when right before the judgment's about to be entered, now all of a sudden the panic enters, like, and that's when it becomes real and they see, okay, this is actually happening. Now, what do I do? Or, um, you know, the just different points of the process just start to trigger them and they see that maybe they'll get angry again. Maybe there's waves of emotions. And so every day is going to be different. Um, and I think for the most part, similar emotions do arise. It just depends on the person, how they are, um, if they've done, if they have some sort of coping mechanism, if they have a healthy way of dealing with the emotions and um, kind of where they are in their own personal and spiritual journey. Yeah. What do you say to someone who is really stuck? They know what they what they want to do, but they can't just take the next step forward. They are just paralyzed with fear and uncertainty and overwhelm and all of those things that are preventing them from leaving something that might be really bad or just doesn't serve them anymore. What kind of advice do you have for her? It this may be a little unconventional, but I think from what, what makes the most sense and what works the best is if you're in that position where you cannot seem to move yourself forward and you, you're just in this overwhelm, I say to just surrender. And, and the surrender in the sense of you don't have all the answers right now. You, it's, it's better than making any decisions based out of a place of fear and just taking a moment to collect yourself. And, and, and it could be a period of, of days, weeks, however long it takes, but to find a way to surrender spiritually and in a way where you maybe have a talk with yourself or whatever higher power people believe in uh, what, you know, what I recommend is saying, okay, I don't have all the answers right now. I'm in this place. I don't know what my next step is, but I'm going to trust that there, there is something bigger here. There's, there's a direction that maybe I don't see at this moment, but it's there and, and I'll know what to do. But right now I'm overwhelmed. I'm in this place where I can't see, you know, what the next step is. And I'm just going to allow this process to just, I'll be guided. I'll know what my next step is when the time's right. And I don't want to make a decision that I made later on regret. So right now I'm just going to surrender, take it day by day and just allow the process to unfold. And when I'm called, when I'm, when I'm inspired, when I know what the right next step is, that's what I'll take. I love that. And I think that's a beautiful take on it. 
And to add to that, I think that this is where the personal development comes into place because once you start to really tap into who you are and your inner spirit and your soul and you start to have conversations with that person yourself, um, you start to become a little bit more confident uh, and, and able to make decisions and really listen to mm -hmm. that voice and just dis make decisions based on that rather than all of that external chatter. And mm -hmm. sometimes being able to cross that threshold and take that step forward involves some of that inner work first, mm -hmm. which a therapist can help with too. I mean, there's a place in this process for professional counseling as well. Do you mm -hmm. agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think therapy is so necessary when I, I recommend clients have a team of people, yeah. experts that they work with, you know, so because everybody does something a little differently, but collectively as a whole, you're basically, you're covered on all levels. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. I think when you have that conversations with yourself and you develop this practice, then you, you're more likely to hear your intuitive voice. You're more likely to trust that your decision is the best one because it doesn't come from a place of fear. Instead, you've allowed it to, your intuition to, to speak to you and you've kind of worked through it. So you recognize which voice is which. Yeah, absolutely. Your coaching is all based on divorcing with dignity. So what does that mean? I think divorcing with dignity is coming from a place of integrity, um, you know, having, being able to make decisions from an aligned place, from a heart centered place is the way I look at it. And so it's similar to what we were just talking about. And so when you take the time to prepare to work on you first, connect with you first, you're more likely to make the decisions from a place that, that comes from the heart versus external influences or things that you feel like you need to do or you know divorce is a very complicated process and so the more connected you are with yourself the more likely you know your core values you know what matters to you what's important you know what to let go of you know what to fight for because that is part of what makes you you and so I think that um, and, and you can only control yourself you can't control how your spouse is going to react you may want you know a peaceful uh, quick divorce, but then maybe it gets dragged out or, you know, there's things beyond your control. But the way I see it is to be in a place where you're connected to yourself, you're making decisions from a heart centered place. And so you're doing it with integrity, you're doing it with grace. And, um, you know, and that's really all you, you can do on your end. But what if their spouse is really difficult and they're not operating from a place of integrity? Should they, you know, I, I think a lot of people will say, well, I don't want them to walk all over me. What's the appropriate response for someone who has a spouse like that? I think boundaries are really important to, to have boundaries of, um, you know, what, what you will and won't tolerate. And so what you will and won't do. And so to have ways to effectively communicate, but then to not necessarily give in, um, you know, just to keep the peace and, and, but you know, what your core values are, you know, what's important to you, you know, what you can give a little, you know, what is worth you know, maybe fighting for. And so, um, yeah, it, the, there's a lot of times where the spouse is difficult. Maybe they have a, a narcissistic personality and, you know, that adds another layer of complication. And so, you know, high, high conflict divorces, the, again, you, you're, you're likely going to have to deal with the drama and the, the conflict, but to do it in a way where, you know, you, you set those checks and balances, you know, where the, the boundaries are. And so, um, maybe not even, maybe if you have an attorney, letting the attorney do a lot of the communicating so you don't have to personally deal with it. Um, there, there are ways to manage. And so unfortunately, again, there's only so much you can do if, if you're coming from a place of integrity, but your spouse isn't. Yeah. Maria, you're an attorney in California, but divorce coaching is all over the country. You are not limited to just your state. So can you share how we can find you, connect with you? I know you have a, a free resource on your website. Can you just share a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, right now, people can find me on Instagram. You know, the handle is Dignified Divorce Coaching. And then the website is www.dignifieddivorcecoaching.com. Some of the resources that I have is just a divorce checklist. So it goes through different aspects that people can, can do before, during, and after divorce. And just kind of walks them through in no particular order, but some things that they need to uh, keep in, in mind and maybe start the process if they're really thinking about divorce, if they're ready. Um, and I have other resources, the Marriage Separation Guide, which helps people um, 
decide if they are ready for a divorce, if, the, if that's something that they want to do, if they're just con contemplating it. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's the, those are the best places to find me. And a final question, what tip do you have for someone who just feels like they're stuck in the divorce process and there's no light at the end of the tunnel? Um, do you have any words of encouragement or inspiration or wisdom for her? Yes, um, just to know that it's all temporary. Um, I think when people are stuck in that place, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But for um, all of the all of the clients I've dealt with, anybody that's gone through a divorce, it is temporary. And so um, you will get through it and to just hold on to that certainty of knowing that this this will pass. You will find your your life post divorce and it will be bright. It will be a lot um, more beautiful than than what you're picturing at the moment. Oh, that's a perfect way to wrap this up. Maria, thank you so much for coming on here. Um, I loved having you. I'm definitely going to have to have you back. So everyone has to check out all of her contact information. And of course, I'll put all of that in the show notes as well. Thank you, girl. Thank you so much, Renee. This was amazing. <laughs>